Nobody knows, at least not yet, when baseball was invented, when the game we watch today was first played. It made its debut in Worcester on a professional level in 1878, but there is no way of telling how many years prior kids of all ages were swinging a stick hoping to make contact. When Worcester Historical Museum was founded in 1875, the city had already seen the demise of one team and was ready to welcome another that would indeed make history. Baseball is probably older than the Declaration of Independence, but not as old as the pyramids. And its family tree has many trunks and branches. The game of baseball, as played in and around New York City in the 1840s, would be recognizable as the game of baseball played at Polar Park in Worcester in 2021. More than any sport, baseball has a history that tends to come full circle. Our Worcester Red Sox are direct descendants of the Pawtucket Red Sox, who, in 1981, played the longest game in professional baseball history, 33 innings. That was the longest professional game but not the longest game ever. That was played in Worcester in September of 1860 between the Unions of Medway and Excelsiors of Upton at the Agricultural Fairgrounds off Seaver Street. It began on September 25th and ended on October 5th, 172 innings in 21 hours and 50 minutes of interrupted playing time. Upton won 50 to 29. Historically, New England's version of baseball was somewhat different than New York's. But when the sport finished being refined in the not-so-big apple of the 1840s, it rapidly took over as the game and in the Northeast evolved from hobby into obsession. The Civil War helped spread baseball, and when it ended, the game exploded. Central Massachusetts rode that wave of interest with a collection of amateur ball clubs, and by the spring of 1878, the city joined the ranks of professional baseball when the Live Oaks of Lynn moved to town. The Live Oaks were dead by September, but in 1879, the Worcester Baseball Association was formed. Led by manager Frank Bancroft of Clinton, it put a team in the National Association the leading minor league in the country, and used the driving park inside the agricultural grounds for a home field. The Worcesters, there were no name the team contests back then, no souvenirs to sell, became one of the best pro teams in any league thanks in large part to the pitching of a Brown University medical school student, Southpaw J. Lee Richmond. Just like today, a good baseball player can make more money than a good doctor. So Richmond went into baseball rather than medicine, at least at first. As a junior, he pitched Brown to the National College Championship in 1879, then moonlighted with the Worcesters in the summer. He threw two no-hitters, one against Chicago of the National League, later to be known as the Cubs. The Worcester's success in 79 led the National League to change its rules for admission. Worcester was not a big enough city by itself to permit the city to join. Bancroft would run the team, and Richmond, when his college days were over, would pitch for it. On Saturday, June 12th, Richmond beat Cleveland 1-0, throwing the first perfect game in baseball history. Since it was the first, nobody knew how rare the feat would become, and it was not called a perfect game. One of the Cleveland outs was a 9-3. Bill Phillips singled to right field, but Worcester's lawn night threw to first before Phillips could get there. The Worcesters finished fifth in 1880, then tried to save money by getting rid of Bancroft. The team finished in last place in both 1881 and 82, then was expelled from the National League. Despite their artistic failure, the Worcesters were not just the first team to win a perfect game. They were also the first team to host a doubleheader and played before a crowd of just six, the smallest crowd ever for a Major League game that admitted fans. Richmond was with the National League team for all three of its seasons. 
but his arm got burnt out early and his career was short. He was the highest paid player of his time at $2,400 a year, but unlike today's stars, had to make a living after baseball. He returned to his native Ohio and went into medicine, then education. His legacy lives on, though, just off Seaver Street on the former campus of Becker College. There stands a granite monument on the site of where Richmond stood, the driving park mound, when he threw the first perfect game in baseball history. While the Worcesters were playing Major League Baseball at the driving park, Ernest L. Thayer was attending Classical High School not that far away. Whether Thayer attended any National League games is unknown. Was he one of the six fans that day in 1882? But six years after the Worcesters were evicted from the National League, Thayer wrote the poem, Casey at the Bat. He was working for the San Francisco Examiner at the time, and Thayer's poem was published in the Examiner on June 3rd of that year with little fanfare. It did not start its journey to legendary status until vaudeville entertainer DeWolf Hopper began reciting it as part of his act that August. Oh, that case, mm, I hate What a time thing to Where Mudville was, and who Casey was, are likely questions that will never be answered. Thayer himself insisted the poem was entirely fictional. Hopper died in 1935, Thayer in 1940, and the Thayer home on Chatham Street was demolished in 1966. Casey at the bat, though, is immortal. After its major league days ended, Worcester had multiple flirtations with minor league baseball through the next 50 years. The city had a triple-A team in the Eastern League, later the International League, at the turn of the century. It featured several fine players, including outfielder Jimmy Sebring, who was with the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1903 and played in the first World Series. The Boston Americans won that World Series, but Sebring hit the first ever home run in a World Series. Worcester's triple-A team had various unofficial nicknames, the Farmers being the most popular, and played at the Oval on Coburn Avenue. It was a lousy ballpark, built mostly for track and field, and at the far eastern end of the city. The team played from 1899 until 1903, when it moved to Montreal in July. The Farmers' various owners all blamed the Oval for their problem attracting fans. In 1906, Worcester resident and future Hall of Fame member Jesse Burkett bought the Concord franchise of the New England League and moved it to his home city. He built a ballpark on Shrewsbury Street, Boulevard Park, and his teams won the New England League pennant every year from 1906 to 1909. The city had teams in Boulevard Park through 1925 when the Panthers, managed by another future Hall of Fame member, Casey Stengel, finished third in the Eastern League. The Panthers moved to Providence in 1926, and Boulevard Park was badly damaged by fire. The city had low-level teams in the minors in 1933 and 34, but that was it for pro baseball until the Worcester Tornadoes came to town in 2005. While Worcester was having moderate success in professional baseball, the College of the Holy Cross was becoming one of the most dominant, arguably the absolute best, baseball program in the country. It started in the late 1800s with the school attracting future big league stars like Louis Sock Alexis. The list of Holy Cross players who had significant major league careers is a long one. It contains names like Bill Carrigan, Jack Barry, Oni Carroll, Andy Coakley, Pat Bork, Gene Desitels, Jumpin' Joe Dugan, Mike Hegan, Doc Powers, Blondie Ryan, Jimmy Ryan, Rosie Ryan, and Jigger Stats. As the Crusaders, Holy Cross won the NCAA Baseball Championship in 1952 under Barry, who coached from 1921 to 1960 
and went 616, 150, and 6. Barry went from managing the Boston Red Sox to coaching Holy Cross. He was preceded by Burkett, who from 1917 to 1920 went 88, 12, and 1. Holy Cross went 70 consecutive seasons without having a losing one. The only blemishes were a 7-7 finish in 1944 and a 5-5 five five record in 46. Holy Cross was such a major player in New England baseball that it attracted major league players, two in particular. On April 15, 1935, the Boston Braves played Holy Cross at Fitton Field with Babe Ruth in the starting lineup at first base. On April 14, 1939, the Red Sox played the Crusaders at Fitton Field and included rookie right fielder, he moved to left in 1940, Ted Williams. Ruth went 0 for 1 in a limited appearance, but found time to pose with the school band playing the trombone. Williams' first at-bat in New England came in the bottom of the first with the bases loaded. He cleared the bases with a grand slam to center field as Boston beat the Crusaders 14-2, avenging a 3-2 loss to Holy Cross in their 1938 exhibition game. The success of Holy Cross baseball had something to do with the inability of minor league baseball to thrive in Worcester. Some of the region's most avid baseball fans could not watch baseball games because they were too busy playing them. The city was honeycombed with amateur teams and leagues, as were the surrounding towns. Every factory had a team and mill owners spent heavily to win. The level of competition was excellent. Many players could have been professionals, but made more money at the mills where they had steady jobs supplemented by their baseball income. If there was a conflict between job and baseball, baseball usually won out. South of Worcester, the Blackstone Valley League was professional in every way except name. Teams in Douglas, Uxbridge, Farnhamsville, Millbury, Whitensville, all the villages, recruited professionals who played under assumed names and got paid under the table. The list is legendary. Lefty Grove was paid by the strikeout. He's on it. Hank Greenberg played for East Douglas under his real name. The Great Depression cut into the money available for Mill League Baseball, and it suffered. Then World War II took many of the players. The leagues resurrected after the war ended, but by the early 1950s, television and the textile industries moved south, killed them. Professional baseball, which ended in Worcester in 1934, returned with the birth of the Tornadoes. They were a professional team in the Can-Am League, unaffiliated with Major League Baseball, and upgraded Holy Cross's fit and field, then renamed it Hanover Insurance Park. Managed by Worcester native Rich Gedman, an all-star catcher with the Red Sox, the Tornadoes won the Can-Am League title in their first season. It was their only league title. But along the way, the Tornadoes sent slugger Chris Colabello, a Milford native and former Assumption College player, to the major leagues. The team collapsed at the end of the 2012 season. Gedman and Colabello long gone. But in 2014, the amateur Worcester Bravehearts took up residence at Hanover Insurance Park. The Bravehearts became the leading franchise in the Futures Collegiate Baseball League and have remained in business despite the arrival of the Worcester Red Sox and the 2020 upheaval of the COVID-19 pandemic. While no Worcester pro team ever appeared in a World Series, two kids teams did. In 1928, the American Legion Post 5 team from the city advanced to the American Legion World Series, played in Comiskey Park, home of the Chicago White Sox. Post 5, which played much of its season in street clothes, met Oakland, California in a best of three series for the national title and was swept. In August of 2002, the Jesse Burkett Little League team from Worcester advanced to the Little League World Series in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Burkett, thanks to a sudden death victory over Harlem on August 22nd, made it to the semifinals before being beaten 4-0 by the eventual series winner, 
Louisville, Kentucky. Baseball in Central Mass has featured legendary players as well as teams. Richmond was the first, although not a native. He was a teammate of Arthur Irwin, a shortstop for the Worcesters, and reputed to be the inventor of the baseball glove, as well as a bigamist with families in Boston and New York. The Farmers featured Worcester native Bill Kitty Bransfield, who got his start in the city's mill leagues and went on to become one of the National League's most reliable and beloved players of the early 1900s with the Pirates and the Phillies. Honest John Anderson was a contemporary of Bransfield's, also a National Leaguer. Anderson is listed as the only Norwegian native to play Major League Baseball, but his family settled in Worcester when he was very young, and Anderson spent most of his life in the city. Of all the Central Mass contributors to baseball history, Connie Mack was probably the most significant. Born in East Brookfield in 1863 when it was still part of Brookfield, Mack was a major league catcher turned manager and owner of the Philadelphia Athletics. His A's teams were the best in the early years of the American League. He managed for 50 years, still the longest tenure in big league history. Barry was Mack's collegiate equivalent, and it was Mack who originally signed Barry out of Holy Cross. Barry spent most of his adult life living in Shrewsbury in a house with an image of baseball bats cut into the shutters. Billy Hamilton is, like Mack, in the Hall of Fame. Hamilton grew up in Clinton and played minor league baseball in Worcester, where he settled with his family. He was considered to be the best base runner of his time, thus the nickname Sliding Billy Hamilton. Wilbert Robinson, a catcher, grew up in Hudson when it was still part of Bolton. Robinson was best known as the longtime manager of the team that became the Brooklyn Dodgers. He was so connected with baseball in Brooklyn that the team's nickname was the Robins when he managed them, winning two National League pennants along the way. One of Robinson's players in Brooklyn was Casey Stengel, who, as his playing career neared its end with the Boston Braves, was assigned to the Braves' farm team in Worcester as player, manager, owner. He did a great job, and at the end of 1925, got an offer to move up to a higher level. In order to do so, Stengel fired himself as manager and quit as owner. He is in the Hall of Fame also, mostly because of his time managing the Yankees. Gabby Hartnett is considered to be one of the best catchers ever to play the game. He grew up in Millville and was discovered playing shop league ball for American Wire and Steel. From there, Hartnett was signed by Jack Mack of the Eastern League Worcester Boosters in 1921, then purchased by the Cubs. He spent most of his career with them. When the Red Sox and Mets played in the 1986 World Series, two Central Mass players had key roles. Boston catcher Rich Gedman, who grew up in Worcester and starred at St. Peter Marion, had achieved all-star status in the American League. Gedman started all 14 postseason games for the Red Sox that year and homered in both the ALCS and World Series. Ron Darling, who grew up in Millbury and played at St. John's, won 136 games in the major leagues and went 1-1 one and one with a 1.35 earned run average in the World Series. Burkett came to Worcester from his native West Virginia to play minor league baseball in 1889. He met a local girl, got married, and stayed in town for the rest of his life. Burkett was a Hall of Fame outfielder who became a great minor league player, manager, and owner, as well as baseball coach at both Holy Cross and Assumption. Pitcher Al Javery from Oxford was a workhorse for the Boston Braves. Javery led the National League in innings pitched with 303 in 1943 when he went 17 and 16. He worked 254 innings in 1944. Then his arm gave out and his career was done by 1946. Javery did not stop throwing though. After retiring from baseball, he became one of the best candlepin bowlers in New England. Northborough's Mark Fidrich was the best pitcher in baseball in 1976, 
the memorable year of the bird. Fidrich went 19 and 9 for the Tigers, led the American League with a 2.34 earned run average, won the Rookie of the Year award, and was second in the Cy Young voting to Jim Palmer. Fidrich started off 1977 equally well, then hurt his arm and was never the same. After retiring from baseball, he settled back in his native Northboro. Hugh Bradley of Grafton played minor league ball for Burkett, then moved up to the Red Sox. His major league career was brief, but in 1912, he became the first batter to hit a home run over the left field wall at Fenway Park, something that fans and players thought might never be done when the park opened that year. Central Mass has contributed three well-known umpires to baseball lore, including Honest John Gaffney, Bill Summers, and Steve Palermo. Gaffney lived in Worcester from age 11 until his death and was called King of the Umpires. He is credited with several umpiring innovations, including the use of protective equipment and stationing umpires behind home plate and in the infield when there was more than one. Gaffney was so highly respected that he became a manager of the Washington team and, as such, brought his team to Worcester in 1887 to play Boston in the last Major League game ever played in the city. Summers, a professional boxer, lived in Upton and worked in the American League from 1933 to 1959. He is best remembered for being the umpire who called Jackie Robinson safe much to the dismay of the Yankees, when he stole home for the Dodgers in Game 1 of the 1955 World Series. Palermo was born and raised in Oxford and was considered to be one of the game's best umpires. He worked in the American League from 1977 to 1991, and his career ended when he was shot and partially paralyzed while trying to apprehend robbers outside a restaurant in Dallas. So here we are, some 118 years later, with AAA baseball back in Worcester. The game is trying new rules, new approaches, to attract modern fans, but in some sense baseball is like Hyman Roth of The Godfather, dying of the same heart attack for 20 years. Its potential demise has been predicted for decades. The game is too long, too expensive now, or so it is said. But. In 1969, with the best tickets in the ballpark going for $3 and games lasting about two and a half hours, attendance averaged about 14000 a game. In 2019, with the best seats selling for $100 and up and games lasting three or more hours, attendance averaged about 28200 a game. That makes sense, for baseball is a backward sport in many ways. The defense has the ball to start a game. A 400-foot fly ball can be an out, and if a batter swings at a strike three that is so bad he can't hit it and the catcher can't catch it, he reaches first base. The game has been a part of our area's culture for, we don't know exactly, but it has been a long time. It is some 160 or so years since the longest game in baseball history was played in Worcester. Now, the team that played the longest game in professional baseball history 120 years later calls the city home. The Worcester Historical Museum is only a year older than the National League. It preceded professional baseball in this city by three years, Major League Baseball by five years. It has been the happiest of marriages. No game other than baseball has provided such an array of artifacts. Bats and balls, caps and gloves, programs and pictures. Baseball cards? When is the last time someone asked to show you their football card collection? Can you recite, line for line, a poem about a basketball game? It is the game of our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and their parents too. It is a living museum piece, 
and some of its most compelling artifacts are on display right here in Worcester. The game has come full circle. <laughs>